Matthew 14, verse number 28, popular verse. Just to recap a little bit, last week we were talking about uh, the concept of God opening and parting the sea and giving us a pathway to walk through things that we couldn't normally walk through and possibilities that we couldn't face now made possible, not because we're great, not because we're powerful, but because God is good and he can do anything that he wants to do, especially on our behalf. So the greatest picture of this obviously being the cross, an impossible circumstance that we could never repay God for the brokenness of sin. So he parts the flesh of his own son and allows humanity to get through. It's not that we escape judgment, it's that we were in the one who was judged so that he took it on our behalf, the greatest journey we will ever take, amen, and we're taking even now today. Um, how many of you guys know that salvation's a process? Now, I believe once saved, always saved. I do hold that theology. I don't think you can lose what you didn't earn in the first place, amen? I think if you believe, you believe, amen? Um, and certainly your acts and your works aren't going to keep it nor gain it, amen? If you couldn't earn it, then you can't lose it by not being a good enough performer. Does that make sense? So everybody breathe, take a breath like this. <sighs> now say, I've got some humanity. You, you've you've got to have permission to not be perfect in the flesh. Now, I'm not talking about empowerment. I'm not excusing and saying, go do whatever you want, okay? I think the Holy Spirit, if he is inside of you, he is going to lead you, convict you, but there's a huge difference between conviction and condemnation, amen? You, don't, you shouldn't be a Christian walking around feeling and talking about how bad of a Christian you are, amen? Not saying we don't have to talk about certain things sometimes that are challenging. We should point out certain flaws in our thinking or our belief system so that we can advance in who the Lord is. Amen. Um, but you shouldn't walk around empowered by Jesus to live the most incredible possible life there is and walk around with your head down feeling like a worthless dirt bag. Right? Amen. He didn't die for you to feel that way. Amen. Yeah. So Jesus gives us an awesome opportunity to take a journey we couldn't take before. The question becomes, is the pathway that God opened up when he parted the sea more our focus than the extremely tall walls of water on either side? I said this last week, but oftentimes in Christianity, we've got this amazing pathway that he paid for, but we're so obsessed with the potential danger on either side that we're not enjoying the journey that we're on. Or we're so obsessed with the enemy that's behind us, aka the devil who was beaten by the cross. Sometimes we're so entangled in what's going on with a defeated ad adversary, or it doesn't even have to be the devil. It could be something in your life that Jesus conquered that maybe just didn't manifest yet, and we're so obsessed with it in our real view mirror that we can't seem to go forward amen and it's a tragedy to have God pave this road for us and us not go in it because we're so obsessed with something else it's no different than me saying hey I'm going to drive over to the mall we don't have a mall do we boy I bombed mall mart <laughs> Right? It's no different than me saying, man, I'm going to get in the car and I'm going to drive up 421 to Walmart. Can't say their thing on TV. They probably charge us. Um, but it would be stupid for me to get on that road and then stop and stare at the signs. And like get so obsessed with how the sign was done. I think, man, that's yellow. And then analyze it, Right? And see, we do this in theology, too. We have this awesome journey to walk out, but we get so obsessed with the signs that all we do is become studiers of the signs. We're never actually going anywhere. Amen? Say, so, man, God, I'm going to this awesome destination of my faith, my salvation. I'm moving on up, getting through the other mountain, uh, getting through that dark valley. I'm breaking through, breaking through, breaking through. You know the people who always need a breakthrough are the ones who are sitting there looking at the sign not moving. Because if you're constantly moving, you're constantly breaking through what he already broke you through. See, breakthrough isn't about you getting through something. It's about God getting you through something. Amen? And all you have to do is walk through what God's doing. But sometimes even in our theology, we get on the road and we get so obsessed with the sign or the wonder. And then our services become about 
whether we wave banners or not, whether we speak in tongues or not, whether we uh, believe Jesus was this, that, or the other, do we believe the Trinity was this version or that version? Is it pre-trib, post-trib, no trib? Is, uh, is the tribulation coming in my lifetime? Or you know, and, and we start having the conversations, and it's it's great talk, but it's not progressive. It stunts our growth. Because what we're saying in essence is the word of God says we can move mountains by our faith. And so we're on the way and then we stop and we stare at the sign and we break it down in Greek and Hebrew and think, man, check this out, right? But see, that's not progressive Christianity. That's stunted growth. And it's not that our hearts aren't good. It's just we can't make a journey out of what simply is a conversation. The conversation is great, but don't stop walking while you're having it. Remember when Jesus took that journey with the two to the, on the road to Emmaus? He talked to them and began to unravel the law and the prophets and everything that was speaking about him. They never stopped. They kept going where they were going. And by the time they got there, guess what? Revelation came. Manifestation came, right? He was always there, but the conversation never stopped the journey. Amen? Does that make sense? So we have an awesome journey. I want to talk about faith in that context a little bit, though. So... Matthew 14, 28, everybody knows this awesome passage. We've taught on it probably 10 different ways. Miracle moment, just to context this, for those of you who don't know this, Jesus is walking on the water. Everybody say crazy. Cray, cray, right? Like this is crazy. Let's just let the context sink in. Imagine if I stepped off this stage and just stood on the air. This is how crazy this moment is, right? This isn't like the magicians on TV. This is Jesus walking on water, right? Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Check this out. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water. Everybody say cray cray. This is a crazy moment. This is context, crazy. Like we read this in Sunday school growing up. We're like, Peter walked on the water with Jesus. (laughs) But like if you really start to think about this is crazy. He's walking on water. This is the God that we serve. He's not a what would Jesus do bracelet. He's the God who walks on water. That's what Jesus would do. He would walk on water, not, he wouldn't care about the bracelet as much as he does the thing, right? He would just do what he's doing. Come, he said, then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Now, crazy moment here. You've got, first off, culture shock in the natural world we live in. The supernatural, or what we call supernatural, is breaking in. Jesus is defying the very laws of nature. His physical substance and makeup as a human form is defying the fact that we know we should always sink when it comes to water. The body shouldn't be able just to flop across it, right? That's not the right word. Walk across it. And Jesus, Jesus came to Peter. He's out of the boat defying the laws of nature, his own creation, and he's just walking on the water. That's only one side of the crazy, miraculous moment. Here's the other side. Peter gets out and walks to Jesus. Now you've got two guys, one who's God in the flesh, and we get why he can do it, right? But now you've got Peter, who is flesh in the flesh still at this point, to the biggest degree, walking on water just like Jesus, Now, he's doing it because of the empowerment of Jesus, not of his own uh, ability, but this is a crazy moment. I mean, who has, uh, and again, you got to think, like, if you saw somebody walking on water and they said, come on, come on out here. I'm thinking, obviously, this is crazy, but he knows something I don't. i got to go with this guy. You know, like, I know I'm not supposed to be able to do it, but he's doing it like, Everything I think I know just went out the window, right? Because if he can do that, what else can he do? You know, like if you can walk on water, what can you do to fire? You know, can you fly? Can you evaporate all the trees and turn them into broccoli? You know, can you just do like any, like the possibilities are not, I'm thinking like, yeah, let's, okay. You know, how many guys have ever tried to walk on water? All right, let's go to the creek. We have a walk on water marathon. Peter gets out, walks on the water. 
the thing that he's swam in his entire life, the thing that he's boated in, fished in, it's a culture that he's not something he's familiar with and he's just sitting there standing on it. Every, let me put it like this, something that he had always known, everything he's ever known, now all of a sudden he's walking on top of. Now keep reading, because it gets a little uh, interesting, but he saw the wind, he was afraid, beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Now, how many of you guys have seen the wind? Trick question. Man, you were the only one, too. Whoa! That was awesome. The only one, and she's front and center. I love that. You just act like you were yawning. You're just like, oh. You can't see the wind. You can see the evidence of the wind, the effect of it. You can see the trees lean. You can see the waves kick up. You can feel it. You can see the response to the wind, but you can't see the wind. It's invisible, right? So he saw the effects of the wind, and immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and said, you of little faith, say little faith. He said, why did you doubt? Whoa. Whoa. Did you hear, whoa. Why did you doubt? Now, normally we would take this and abuse everybody and say, you don't have enough faith. And I want to shatter that idea this morning because if you've ever had somebody tell you you don't have enough faith, that's garbage. And I taught on this a, a few months back, but everybody in this room has amazing faith. You say, well, no, I'm struggling with my faith. No, 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 You're, you might be struggling with Christian faith, but you have amazing faith. Everybody that's in this room got in your car, hit the gas pedal, cranked it up, by faith came to this church today. It wasn't necessarily a supernatural journey that you took, but it took faith to get here because you've got faith that the car is gonna start. You've got faith that when you hit the pedal, it's going to move. You've got faith that when you're going 65 miles an hour and you hit the brake pedal, it's going to stop. And that's faith you don't even have to think about. Think about the great faith you have and how easy it is when you don't have to think about it. Mm. And so Peter gets out of the boat. He's walking on water like Jesus. He sees a circumstance. Now, think about this moment. He's in the middle of a circumstance that should blow his mind. And then he sees a circumstance that he's familiar with, and all of a sudden, the one he's familiar with trumps the one that he's in the middle of. And so no longer is he walking on water, he's scared by what he's seeing the wind accomplish. He begins to sing, save me, Jesus. And Jesus does this awesome move. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, here's the problem. It, no disrespect toward, toward the Lord, because if, if that's really what that meant, that would almost be a jerk move. Because I'd be thinking, if I was Jesus in that moment and that's what the context was, and I'll fix that in a second, I wouldn't really rebuke Peter. I would rebuke the other guys who didn't even try. I'd be like, you know what? You went for it. You took five steps. That's five more steps than you've ever taken before. These guys are a bunch of losers. Look at them. <laughs> losers, right? I'd be picking up fish and throwing them in the boat. I'd be hitting somebody with a tuna, you know? Like, you don't send Peter out here. He sinks, but at least he sank trying to go for it, amen? Better, better to go for it than to just sit there in the safe zone, right? There's a good message, right? But he says, Peter, you of little faith. And if I was Peter, I'd say, what the heck is wrong with you? I mean, good Lord. Literally, good Lord. Like... I, I did my best. I mean, little faith. I walked on water. That's not little. I mean, that's some, you know, like it took some faith for me to get out of the boat, trust you as long as I did, you know, like, come on, that, that's, that's a little bit of a blow. Do you ever get in cultures and you didn't see maybe a miracle or you didn't see a breakthrough or you didn't, you know, get what you were contending for and people say, well, you didn't have enough faith. Oh, you got enough faith, plenty of faith. Plenty of faith, right? You didn't get healed, and they start trying to figure out why. You know what that is? That's us on the journey, and then we stop at the sign and start getting obsessed with it. We say, well, we're on the journey of salvation, but I'm not seeing everything manifest the way that I think it should manifest, so let me stop at these road signs and figure out why. 
And before we know it, we're stuck at the visitor center halfway through the journey starting a church somewhere based on an idea of everybody not having enough faith. And everybody comes through the door, we want to fix all their faith levels. And I'm a big contender for faith. I think we should have great faith in the gospel. Amen? But Peter had great faith. He was a man of great faith. He said, well, no, Jesus said, you got little faith. But if you look at the word little there, in the Greek, that word doesn't mean quantity. It actually is talking about a duration of faith, not a size of faith. So what he's saying is your faith is it's not small in its makeup. It's brief in its longevity. In other words, it's not that you don't have faith, but why did you stop short? O oh, you of little faith, O oh, you of short faith, why did you start and stop? You understand that Hebrews is talking about, uh, I believe it's uh, chapter number 11, starts talking about the great men of faith that we talk about. You understand all of those people had great faith, right? Now, did all of those people perfect it? No. You know what all those people had in common? They had faith that didn't stop. By faith. Now, they messed up all on the road, right? But they didn't stop walking. They didn't get on the journey and Abraham get halfway through and hit a hiccup. And even, I mean, even when he tried to fulfill the promise himself, he didn't let it stop him from still moving forward in God. When Moses started out leading the Israelites, even though I know they had a, a Jerry Springer episode out for 40 years in the wilderness doing their thing and, you know, making idols every five seconds, sinning everywhere. I mean, this is a doggy pile of crazy for 40 years is what this is, right? And they're out there, you know, but they, they didn't stop. They just kept going and going and going and going for it, right? These guys had faith because they didn't stop, not because they were good at faith. But see, we try to condemn the church for not being good enough at faith, and that's why things aren't happening. Uh, everybody in this room has faith that can move mountains. The key is, is your faith in the evidence of the wind around you, or is it in the pathway that God has for you? You have great faith, but where is it dialed into? You have huge faith, but is it faith in what I'm seeing or faith in what God's trying to do? See, he opened up a pathway, and by faith, when he parted that sea, by faith, they had to walk in the mouth of a sea that had been open, right? That now had jaws that could crush them. You say, well, how do you know that? Because it crushed the army that followed them. Could have just as easily have crushed them. But they had to trust God and have faith to take the journey and get to the other side. And so they start the journey. And like I said last week, I know for a fact if I was there walking in between the walls of water, I would be looking at those walls of water constantly. I mean, think about it. Because you're thinking... It's not, like a, it's not like from here to the back of the room kind of walk. This was a little bit of a walk to get to the other side, right? And you don't want to get halfway out there and realize God forgot about you and the pool starts to cave in, right? I guarantee you there's a lot of fear on that road. A lot of, oh my gosh. I guarantee you when Peter got out of the boat and stepped out, I mean, ima- imagine the, the milliseconds or whatever it took for his brain to process and respond to what's taking place, and I'm sure he responded quicker than his brain could keep up, but imagine the few seconds before that first step, and as he starts to land the plane on the water, imagine those couple of seconds just probably wondering, oh, is this going to work? Am I about to die? Is this guy crazy? Is he floating on something and I can't see it? You know, like, is he, is this like one of those tricks, you know? Like, imagine those crazy attacking voices and thoughts and ideas that come through the humanity that we are in the moments of our breakthrough right before he stepped foot on the water. Now, here's the crazy thing. You put yourself in Peter's shoes. He steps on the water. I gotta get my balance. I'm not Peter. Steps on the water. 
oh my gosh, it's working. I'm not, <clears throat> I probably, he probably tried to push it down a little just to make sure, you know. I mean, sometimes I walk up some rickety stairs and I'm just making sure they work before I go up them, you know, like much less water. You know, he's probably looking for a fish under his foot, you know, thinking, okay, you know, lucky shot, stepped on a shark, you know, like I can, <laughs> you know, once he realizes, hey, this is water, I'm standing on it. And imagine the culture shock, the faith. I mean, this is like a shot of heaven. I mean, it's like, it's like heaven insulin all of a sudden, probably coursing. Everything's getting jogged up. He's starting to question everything in milliseconds. Everything that he's known is being challenged. He steps out on it. He says, oh, my gosh. Steps out with the other foot. Now, here's the other side of it. Ooh, can you fully let go, right? Because it's you can have one foot in the boat and one foot on the water and be like, Cool. But I bet it was that second step that really jarred him. Because once he stepped out with the second one, it was over. He was now vulnerable to the circumstance that he was going for. Nothing to hold on to except Jesus. And he steps out. Imagine the faith. Imagine the culture of standing on the water with Jesus just for the first second, stepping out, and all of a sudden, everything that you've ever known is upside down. Fascinating. He's in the middle of miracles. He is in the middle of a heavenly intervention. He's in the middle of something so crazy but unfamiliar. And then the familiar part kicked up. He saw the waves probably start to do something. He saw maybe the boat rocking a little bit. He saw the wind and the effects of the wind. And all of a sudden, what he knows about the wind and the world around him and how it's always been trumps the path that he's in the middle of. And he starts to sink. Jesus says, you have a little faith. Not because it was small faith. But because he didn't let it last long enough. So I wonder how many promises of God we give up on. Not because we didn't have faith, but because we stopped it short. Amen? So how many times do you give up on yourself and some kind of manifestation of your salvation thinking that you're worthless or thinking that you're not good enough or thinking you'll never conquer the sin issue or addiction issue or thinking, man, I just, I can't, 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 only to find out that it's just the longevity of your faith that's the issue, not the actual thing that you're under. So we've let people tell us, man, we don't have enough faith, we're not good enough, we didn't do all the right steps, and really sometimes it's just time. Yeah. Amen. You understand that natural wars take time? They take time. So do spiritual ones. Yep. Can God just zap it? Yep. But sometimes that's not part of the journey. Case in point, he could have taken the Israelites, picked them up, and set them on the other side, never fooled with the water. He could have picked Peter up out of the boat, threw him out there, and said, you're going to swim today, boy. Or are you going to walk today, I guess? You know? But he didn't. God so has something set apart in the journey that we take with him. It's the unfolding of who he is in our nature, right? It's the discovery of who we were always meant to be. It's the relationship with Jesus. See, I hear people preach this all the time about relationship with Christ, relationship with Christ, man, this, that, and the other. And I love that, but real relationship is not association. It's relationship. I can be associated with Christ, but not have a relationship with Christ. I can be associated with the name of Jesus, but not really know Jesus. Does that make sense? In other words, like, Jesus is my best friend, but is he really? See, God wants us to take a journey that does get us from one place to another. 
The gospel is that powerful. It's not about like knowing about Jesus stuff or like I, even like the stuff we did last night. I love it. I love like that stuff's so important. But that, if that's all it is to some people, we have an issue, right? See, I don't want my life to be the same today or tomorrow as it is today just because I didn't have the faith level to make it that far. You know what you've gotta be able to do? You've gotta be able to, to reject lies and just keep moving. If you wanna see God do great stuff in your life, if you wanna see breakthrough, stop thinking about the breakthrough so much, much and just keep walking. Yeah, walk. Amen? Yeah. We don't need to build cultures on breakthrough, we need to build it on following Jesus. Guess what, the greatest breakthrough is following Jesus. If you wanna break through some stuff, then figure out where he's going and go with him. Yeah? See, let me say it like this, come here Matt. You're Jesus Christ, because you have a beard. I did say beard, not beer. Some of you guys. So, like this would be, oh, I need something. Um, let me look back here, I don't know. See you guys later. This is a mess. Huh? Uh, what is this? This will work. It's a box. Get in this box. <laughs> this is what it would be like. You sit down. I'm going to sit over here. Everybody see me? And Matt, it's more important you see Jesus. But there's Jesus. See, this is, this is breakthrough mentality a lot of times in church. Hey, Jesus. Jesus! Well, I guess he's not going to talk to me. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I was starting to wonder if this was a ventriloquist act. <clears throat> um, I need breakthrough today. And this is what a lot of our Christianity is. It's us sitting on this side of this box yelling at Jesus, praying to Jesus, trying to dial his phone, saying, man, I just need breakthrough. I need to get to Jesus. I need to get to that new thing in my life. I need to get to that place in my faith. I need to get to that place in my righteousness. I need to get to that place. Jesus, I need breakthrough. And this box is the thing we need to break through, right? And this is what we think. It's keeping me from God. But this is the illusion. This is what we make. See, if you want breakthrough, then you just simply go where he's at. But a lot of our breakthrough theology is some hurdle we've made by faith, in the faith. We put up a roadblock on the journey. What we've done is we put a toll booth in the middle of the Red Sea crossing, and we said, you can get across, but it's gonna cost you this. That's not the road Jesus made, it was a free one, right? And what we do is we put the cross up and we magnify it for people, call it the gospel, say, hey, you can get to God, but it's gonna cost you this. Guess what? It, the cross doesn't cost you anything. But we say, hey, I need to get to God. I need to break through all my stuff. I need to get perfect. I need to get better. I need to get all oh, this stuff. And what we do is we sit here in the middle of a road listening to all the lies swirling around us, never moving anywhere because we're so crippled by fear. We're so crippled by false identity that we don't want to move. We don't think we're good enough to move. We don't think we can come boldly to the throne of grace. We don't think that God really hears our prayers like he does the really good intercessors. We don't think that God really hears our worship or I can worship like the worship. I mean, we don't think we know God like other people because we're not good enough. And I was thinking about this the other day, like, um, let's just chill here. I like it. I was watching um, some of the lead up to this boxing fight last night, and I don't really watch fight, but from, this one caught my attention for some reason. Some of the filthiest, dirtiest trash talk you'll ever see. I mean, every word is beeped out. Oh, it's not beeped out, but in my brain it is because I'm a Christian. Oh, you guys don't have that? It, yeah, it's a, no, no joke. Prayer time, go to a app store, download it. It's an app that anything that's bad, you're protected from. 
<sighs> so I'm like watching it and they're just like, I mean, they're just trash. Tra- and it's silly. Like it's like 14 year olds got too much money, you know, like, and they're just yelling at each other, tearing each other down. You're a blankety blank, 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 blank. And I'm watching this one guy just put everything he's got into screaming in this guy's face, like spitting on him. And I'm thinking, you know, like, wow. And the other guy's just sitting there in this moment, and I'm, I don't know how the rest of the moments were, but he's just sitting there, got his head down, he's just, he's just taking it. Nodding his head. Probably wasn't agreeing with it, but he's, he's just listening. You know, sitting there taking it. I don't know about you guys, but you see this on like the bully TV shows where there's a victim somewhere, there's a bully, and the bully's always yelling something over the victim's life. Hey, you're blah, 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 blah. And a lot of times people who don't fight back, they just sit there and they listen. And they take it in, they listen, they listen, they listen. And you know, this is the heartbreaking part of what Calvary was. And I could feel as I was watching that, you wouldn't think God's in this, but he is. As this guy was tearing down the other guy, and they're tearing each other down, and this guy's just sitting there taking it, I felt the Lord just speak to him and say, you know what, this is what I feel every day. I thought, what do you mean? Like, you, you know who you are. Like, you know. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm who I am, but I'm also who you are. So I'm in everybody here. And when we allow ourselves to receive lies every single day and don't do anything about it, it's like God's sitting there feeling the pain of every single thing that goes through us. And when you sit around behind your box with Jesus on the other side thinking that there's something keeping you from him because you're ashamed, he's taking that shame. And when you feel like, man, I'm just not good enough, he feels the pain of that, you know? See, the Bible says, don't let your good be spoken of as evil, or evil is good. In other words, where God's called you righteous, Don't you dare let lies come in at this point of the journey and call you something other. Because of a moment of weakness, don't you dare think one moment of weakness can sabotage eternal destiny that was exacted by Calvary. Don't think that one moment of not being able to do it. See, this is the issue I think that Peter was facing. He's got out of the bow. He saw the thing. Fear hit in, and in that little split second, you've got a decision to either say, man, I'm going with this, or I'm going to stay with this. And my question is for our lives this morning is which one's bigger? Is the circumstance of the world bigger or the circumstance that God has placed you in bigger? Because whichever one you give faith to is what manifests. You're either walking on everything that you've known or you're sinking in everything that you've known. In other words, God can take you somewhere that may seem unfamiliar, even though it probably really is familiar, or you can sink in what has always been familiar. Let me put it like this. You can sit on this side of something thinking you need a breakthrough to get to God, or you can just start to believe the truth that you're already through this and there is no box. See, guys, this is the lie. This is what the enemy does. God makes a path, the enemy puts this, like Mario Kart, right? He leaves turtles and bananas, right? He does, right? He just leaves stuff, and because he knows we're curious people, that's how he got us in the garden. Remember that part? If you do this, and we're like, oh, tell me more. I mean, come on, he could sell everybody in this room a rainbow vacuum cleaner, and you'd be paying for it for two years. You know what? He's like, oh, have you seen this? Put your couch cushion in a bag and watch it. Wow, what a vacuum, right? That's what he did though. Check out this fruit, it's the hottest fruit on the market. It's the best thing you've ever seen. It'll make you like God. You're thinking, wow, tell me more. How much is it? Oh, it's free. They take the fruit, but he knows that about our nature. So all he does, he has no authority. All he does is put things out in front of us or around us. 
because he knows we're curious enough to go take of it. And what did curiosity in the beginning do? It caused us to take something thinking it would get us to God. But what was the truth in the beginning? There never was this. We were already right here. But what he does is he puts something there thinking, oh, I need a breakthrough. Adam needed the biggest breakthrough that ever existed. Jesus was it. Guess what? We're in Jesus, right? You were seated with Christ in heavenly places. You are the righteousness of God. You are holy because he made you holy, not because you deserved it. Doesn't matter if you deserved it or not. He did what he did because he so loved the world that he gave something no one else could give. He gave something no one could earn. The Bible says, don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. In other words, Peter, don't be conformed to what you see in the world. Be renewed by the fact that you're walking on water with me. Let that start to become more and more your reality rather than what you've always known about the storm. Because the truth is, the storm was not about to alter what Jesus would or wouldn't do. Remember that time the storm kicked up? Jesus is asleep. Everybody's freaking out. And he gets up and just says, chill out. Like, chill out. Which is bigger? What God says about you or what's familiar to you? Which is bigger? The atmosphere of negativity when you clock in tomorrow morning or the atmosphere of positivity of heaven that's inside of you? Because whichever one you're looking at is the one that you're giving faith to. And the one that you give faith to is what you produce. Yep, you become what you behold. And Jesus is just sitting there. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? We make salvation so hard. Like how hard is it to re just receive a gift? Like you ever get a Christmas present? and it takes you like eight years to figure it out. I don't mean like a puzzle, I mean like to figure out how to open it or to have it. We make it complicated. If I gave Matt this bottle cap, said this is yours, how hard was that? I mean, come on. I'm not saying there's not discovery in that. Of course, he's gonna like look at the bottle cap, play with the bottle cap, maybe eat it, I don't know, <laughs> right? Yeah, go ahead and eat, no. <laughs> this is for the Lord. But how hard is it to just to receive it and say, you know what, it is what it is. In our fallenness, we need to feel like we can qualify ourselves. We need to perform, we need to not feel good like if like sometimes we're like man it's just too good to be true it's like yeah it really is see it puts us out of our comfort zone to not feel like garbage if it puts us out our out of our comfort zone Zim, zone to really start to believe and receive the fact that i'm worthy because he made me worthy to call myself the righteousness of christ to call myself the son of the father that's hard for people, but it's part of the journey. And usually in our faith, it's that second step. We take the first one, like I believe, We've got all these principles, ideas, things, faith, yeah, yeah, yeah. but can you really take the second one and say, you know what? I'm tired of the enemy having voice in my life. I'm tired of the lies that were spoken over me. I'm tired about people saying, well, that's the way I was raised. That's just how it's gonna be. It doesn't matter what your DNA is or how you were raised or how were your culture. You were born in a new family. Everything that was in your lineage prior, guys, generational curses only work if you are still building your belief system on the family you were born out of. But I was born of God. Amen. And he doesn't have curses in his history. Amen. The only curse that was in his history was one he dealt with 2,000 years ago, the curse of mankind. And that's my daddy now, you know, like, come on. I don't have to have diabetes because my family had diabetes. Come on. But we think because we're familiar and we try to believe God and we're like, yep, 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 I got it. And then we see the effects that it's having on our family and it starts to make us sink in it like this. And we think, man, I don't have to have it. I don't have to have it. But then we might see a loved one who's in the hospital because of something. We think, oh, it's, I'm next. Come on, I'm right. 
We allow the circumstances of the familiar to trump the unfamiliar journey that we're on with God. And we think, man, well, my mom had diabetes. I've got to watch my sugar. It's in my DNA. No, no, no. God's in your DNA. He wrote your DNA. You think, man, oh, that's a good idea. No, no, no. It's even scientific. Everything about you can change. They say, well, no, it's just the way I think. It's how it's always got to talk to. I'm closing with this thought, but the other day I was talking to a friend of mine, and he's has terrible financial habits, always broke, and he knows it. And he talks about it. He's like, well, my family's always been like that. That's how I'll always be. And I'm just like, wow. Like, at least fight a little bit. See, that would be the mentality I would say, you have little faith. Guess who that mentality is? That's the guys in the boat who says, you know what? I can't walk on water, and that's just how it's always gonna be. But one guy got out and said, you know what? Let's go for it. Let's try. Let's fight a little bit. Let's, let's just try this out. Because if I let every box in my life get in my way of what I can or cannot do or what it, how far it can or cannot get me into salvation or dreams or overcoming, whatever it is, it may be a goal that's in you, but you've got too much fear to even go for it. Guess what? Go for it. Don't ever feel like you've got to get through this to be ready to go for it. Like, we don't have kids yet. We're going to have some. But you know what the one thing people always say? You're never ready to have kids. I'm like, yeah. Guess not. You know, like. Guess what? You're never, you're never ready to be saved. Can I say that? I'm not saying, like, you, you're... You might be desperate and ready. Like, I understand that you might be set up to receive it, but you're never ready for what he's got. You're never ready for it because to imply that you're ready would be to imply that somehow you prepared yourself for it, which usually goes back to earning it. If you receive it, you receive it. And guess what? Some of the filthiest people on this planet can receive it and not look like you right away. But guess what? They're part of the crew that's walking through the sea with us. And we've got to honor that. We've got to celebrate it. We've got to acknowledge it. We can't be stuck in cultural bubbles or boxes that we made thinking that God's on the other side of somebody's style. Come on. It doesn't matter if you have tattoos or earrings. It doesn't matter if you've got Mary, the mother of Jesus, on your back tattooed in blue ink. Guess what? You're just as valuable. Isn't it funny? Isn't it funny we've made that a value issue in the body of Christ? Well, so and so's dipping snuff. <laughs> He's going to hell. I mean, he is flirting with the line, brother. So and so's got a nose ring now. Have you seen that? She came in church with a nose ring. I mean, that's just scandalous. Flirting with the line. <laughs> Couple problems here. We're condemning our brother who dips and the one who likes piercings. But we're stuffing donuts in our body. <laughs> and I love donuts. I'm just saying you can't condemn somebody else when you've got equal issues and some, it may not be the way this might not be the same way, but it's the equal issue. Amen? Not one thing's greater than another. Whatever is bad for your body is bad for your body. Amen? And I guarantee you some tattoos are a lot better for you than what we eat. Hey, Amen. Hear that, FDA. <laughs> Come on. One tattoo is way better and safer for you than a box of Cheez-Its. I will absolutely stand by that. You're putting processed, man-made chemicals in your body. They're just putting a little ink on the surface of the skin or whatever it is. I mean, it might fade and look ugly when you get older. I don't know. I don't know how that works. But guess what? I keep eating those cheeses. Some other things are going to fade and look ugly as I get older. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's not good. You get this little thing here. Don't take care of yourself. Condemn everybody who's dipping snuff. But I'm Bilbo Saggins by the time I'm 75 years old. <laughs> Walking to church, condemning everybody else. <laughs> right? 
That's what we do, though. We huff and puff, we preach, we get our quiver and our voice, we condemn everybody while we literally have the Feast of Tabernacles sticking out. <laughs> it's true. It's true. We send them to hell and we can't even breathe. <laughs> See, I love, I love how good of a father he is. That he just looks at all of our stuff and it's like, this is just family. This is what family does. We yell at each other, we condemn each other, we don't know what the heck we're doing. Let's just, can we come to that place in Christianity and say, you know what, he's the way, the truth, and the life. Truth, <laughs> see? He's the way, the truth, and the life. He was crucified, paid for our sin. He was buried, he rose again on the third day, ascended to the Father. He imparted his spirit into us. He commissioned us to do something that's impossible, but everything we know about him, he's the God who makes the impossible possible. So that's all we really know. Think about it. When it comes to theology, that's all we really know. Well, how's he do it? Who knows? You understand, well, well how, do we, how does salvation work? I promise I'm done. How does this work? How does this work? How does this work? And the how always gets you eating from the fruit of the garden because you're trying to figure out how to do something that he didn't give you the answer for. It's the equivalent of saying, Jesus, how are you walking on the water? He didn't tell us. He didn't say, well, you got to take these seven steps to your breakthrough of walking on the waves. He didn't write a book called Walking with Jesus, dot, 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 on the water, Part two, the five steps that will get you there. He didn't give you the, um, at least I checked on our ushers might have this, but he didn't give us the manual on how to multiply the loaves or the fishes. He didn't give us whatever 10 steps he took to do it, you know, those ones that were in the Bible. Yeah, the ones that he didn't do, but all of a sudden we have to do, you know, like, <laughs> He gave us this one step. He's like, you know, just believe in my name. Believe that I'm who I am. Pretty easy. Pretty easy. Salvation's easy. It's a journey, don't get me wrong. But it's the easiest thing if we let it be. You don't have to be perfect today. You don't have to be perfect tomorrow. You just have to follow Jesus can't tell people they've got to be perfect to follow Jesus. That's not salvation. That's not salvation. Because if that were the case, none of us could follow him.